What's up, everybody? Welcome to Puzzle Huddle with Experts. We have another fantastic guest, Dr. Janita Pritchett. She's a PhD scientist. Uh, she's a educator, coach, uh, STEM advocate. I want to call you camp designer, counselor, STEM uh, protocol, curriculum, uh, guru, uh, lo lots of different wonderful things. Uh, so we're excited to talk to you about um, lots of things that you do and then get an understanding of how we can recreate some of these things in our households, uh, in our schools for, for our kids. If you could take a moment, uh, Dr. Pritchett, and explain to us what your PhD is in and, and uh, just a little context so we can understand our, our point of entry here. Absolutely. Well, one, thank you so much for having me here. It's a pleasure to sit down and talk with you. Um, so as you mentioned, I'm Dr. Janita Pritchett, and I got my PhD in analytical chemistry. So there's a lot of different types of chemistry uh, majors that you could go in. There's organic chemistry, inorganic chemistry, uh, analytical chemistry, and several others. So as an analytical chemist, what that means I like to do is break things down and figure what figure out what's there. Oftentimes, organic chemists are those that synthesize things. They bring different molecules together to create new things. And they'll work with analytical chemists to say, did I actually create the thing that I wanted to have in there? And so I use a number of different instruments like uh, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry, or liquid chromatography to actually take the sample, break it into smaller parts, and then use a detector to figure out what's really there. Um, so my PhD research was looking at um, diseases of the retina, specifically um, glaucoma and diabetic retinopathy, and understanding how, as those diseases progressed, how were neurotransmitters changing in the samples that we were collecting as possible indicators that this disease is actually advancing in the, the, the subject that we're looking at. Um, so again, analytical chemists, we take a sample, whether that's a, a urine or biological sample, or perhaps some illicit drug or, or plant material, take it, run it through a couple of you know, extractions, break it down and figure out what's in there. Well, I got to say, now that you mentioned that, I've, I've started my journey as well. So I can make slime with my kids with my eyes closed. So okay. I, I, don't know, I don't know how many college credits that gets me, but um, if it gets me something, then I have that many. Uh, I've earned that many. There you go. I mean, that's you on your way to get a, a degree in organic chemistry. You're bringing <laughs> things together and making something new. <laughs> get me laughed out of the room. If you, if you could tell me, if we could go back to your childhood, you, you were raised by two, two scientists. Yeah, yeah. Uh, both my parents were nuclear engineers. They actually met in a physics class, and um, they were the people that really inspired me to pursue my science journey. How, what, what was your understanding of that as a child? Did you understand that they were nuclear physicists? Or what most kids have, you know, very interesting interpretations of what their parents do. What was your childhood in, interpretation of their careers? So it's very funny that you asked that. I used to go to like take your daughter to work day all the time. And I just remember seeing so much technology around me. There were like lights and buzzers and machines and computers yeah. and everything around. And even though I was going to take your daughter to work day, um, you know, formally known as take your daughter to work day, I still didn't really understand the magnitude of what it is that they were doing. And quite honestly, even today, still couldn't probably articulate <laughs> in a way that I could should be able to what they did. But for me, it was just, it was inspiring. You know, I thought my parents were the smartest people in the world. Like any question that I ever had, I knew I could go to them, um, you know, especially math. Like my, both of my parents were just like fantastic in math. Um, so I never really found myself struggling in those subjects because I could easily go home to my, my parents. My dad ultimately ended up transitioning into working as a college math professor. And okay. so, you know, there's a lot of uh, parallels between his career and mine, um, where I now use my, my ability to teach chemistry in much of the same way, manner that he uses to teach math to students. What, what might have been some of your, your favorite toys as a child? So don't laugh. One of them. Was a microscope. <laughs> it, it was a, <laughs> it what? Was a microscope. I, I cannot okay. lie. Okay. I did get my first microscope when I was five. It's red. I still have it actually to this day. Um, but I was also a big fan of the Cabbage Patch dolls. Like I had like probably four or five Cabbage Patch dolls. They used to come with a little certificate and I, I just loved them. They were my babies. <laughs> and they were uh, during the holiday season, hard to find, hard to purchase. So your, your parents likely jumped through some hoops uh, in order to yeah. secure those. Uh, and this was before, you know, button clicking and, and probably home delivery. So right, um, right. Chance you had to go out and get it, which 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 adds to the, you know, the, the mania of the holidays. Uh -huh. So in addition to uh, a very science oriented household, what other activities, you know, classes, what other things did you do as a child growing up? 
So when I was younger, some other things that I was interested in, one, I played the saxophone. It's kind of funny. I used to parallel um, my life to the Simpsons because, you know, Homer worked at the nuclear power plant. They had this like beige color house. So our house actually looks like the Simpson house. We have the older brother, myself, and then uh, a, a younger sister. So like Bart, Maggie, Lisa, or Bart, Lisa, Maggie, I guess. So I played the saxophone. I was into sports. So I played softball. I was a pitcher um, for a, our mm -hmm. team. I actually pitched a no-hitter in uh, one of our, our uh, baseball fields then. So I, that was like my claim to fame um, back then in, in high school. Um, and then I also really loved to travel. At a young age, I realized that I loved to travel. So my family, we used to take road trips to a lot of places. So, uh, you know, every year we were going to Alabama where their family was located. We would drive to like New York, um, Ohio. We were uh, located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So we would drive pretty much everywhere. So I would say playing sports, you know, being outside. I was a, very much a tomboy growing up. Um, so playing sports with my brother or playing organized sports, um, playing the saxophone and then getting into, you know, art, my probably my art creativity side of the house started picking up in my high school years as well. How much pressure, if if at all, did you feel from your parents to go into a, a STEM career? Was that something that was uh, you were kind of being coached into, or was that something that you owned uh, in your own skin and you were already determined to go in that direction? So I wouldn't say I had pressure. I think I had encouragement for sure. Like, you know, they put us in computer camp. Again, I had a microscope when I was younger, but they also encouraged us to try all types of things. And so my parents' rule was anything I came home and said, hey, mom, I'm interested in doing, I could do it, but I had to commit to doing it for one year. And so whether that was, um, you know, something that was science oriented or when I joined marching band, um, it was, you had to do it for a year before you could just say, you know, this isn't for me. Um, so I wouldn't say I felt pressure at all. In fact, you know, my high school years, I actually was a bit rebellious where I didn't want to be the smart person. I didn't want to be, you know, the, the, the nerd, if you will. Um, but I really had a, a teacher, an educator that really got me back on course to being like, you know, no, this is what I want to do. I always was curious. I was the child outside playing with rocks and, and you know, making magnifiers to look at things. Um, and so I think that teacher that I had in 10th grade reinvigorated that, that love I had for science and curiosity that ultimately pushed me in the direction um, of following a STEM career. I heard you mention in another interview that you weren't, you weren't always necessarily achieving at your best in terms of your grades. What, what was your parents' feedback to that um, and them knowing you as your child and your maybe your potential versus you know you 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 trying your best and what's the difference between this trying my best and I'm just mailing it in. Well, how, how does your parents coach you in that that context? Well, you know, they looked at it as, again, this is a teenage girl that's trying to find herself, right? So I was in, you know, the accelerated classes in middle school and high school, but I was also, again, the nerd. Um, and so I decided ninth grade, I didn't want to be the nerd anymore. So I, you know, was not like purposely not turning in assignments. I was, you know, skipping class, mom, don't get mad at me. Um, and, uh, you know, I was you know, just doing things I had no business doing when it came to my education. And it wasn't that I couldn't do it. I just didn't want to do it. And then, like I said, from my parents' perspective, they, they were talking to me like, hey, what's going on? You know, um, do, do we need to get you a tutor? Do we need, you know, what do you need to, to make you feel more supported here? And it really was just like, I just want to be cool. Like, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the nerd. Um, but then it was like I said, that 10th grade year, I had a teacher that literally, um, he pulled me to the side and he said something to me that was, again, I carry with me to this day. He showed me a set of grades and was like, hey, this is at a parent teacher conference. He said, hey, these are the grades. These are the, like the A's, the B's, the C's. And this last A here is you. And he was like, now you didn't earn this A, but I know you could have. And something about, you know, hearing that external voice also feeding into the same energy that my parents were feeding. That was the light bulb. That was the switch that was needed to get me like, you know what? You're right. I didn't, I didn't need you to give me a grade. I could have, I, I know I could have got this grade too. And so from there on out, I started, you know, made it a point to earn the grade. And it's funny because at the end of that year, my guidance counselor said a note to my parents like, oh, Janita has made such an improvement in her grades. And it was just like, no, she's just doing what she was supposed to be doing or could have been doing all along. We're just glad that she, she realized it herself. Um, so, yeah. Well, I, I know you work with a lot of young people. What, what, kind of, uh, uh, what kind of advice do you offer to kids that, that you might see more potential in, in them than they're actually executing? Uh, because that, that same social pressure st still exists among young people and, and trying to fit in and be cool. And, and there, there might be some cases where 
cool does not mean the high achieving academic student, sadly so, but to whatever degree that does still exist, how do you, what do you say to those young people uh, to help them activate to their highest potential? Right. I mean, that's a fantastic question. So one of the things we always stress, you know, I run a program called Steam Ford Academy. So we stress to our students there to, hey, one, we encourage curiosity. A lot of times people don't want to show up as their best self because they don't want to ask questions. If they get stumped a little bit, um, if they're not really following along, they don't want to ask for fear of being the outsider in that particular situation. And then they go on, you know, for as long as they may go, not feeling confident in that particular thing. So the first thing first, we encourage is curiosity, like ask questions, engage with us. If you didn't get something, let us know. Um, but we also make sure to you know, bring our authentic selves to every classroom that we are there. So we talk about some of the fun things that we do in our, in our jobs that a lot of people don't associate with being a scientist. You know, not people, most people don't think as a scientist, you could travel the world. Most people don't think as a scientist, you could do interviews and show up on TV. So we try to also show the side of science that a lot of people don't necessarily get to see because they have a, a preconceived idea of what a scientist does or the work that they ultimately can do. So we really just try to help them rethink of what could be if they were to go into this field or any field. Um, and then we also just, you know, want them to feel like they belong. So whenever they're coming to our classroom, you know, we talk to them like, hey, doctor, how was your weekend? Or mm -hmm. hey, such, you know, we, we bring them in and not treat them as a child, but recognize that, hey, you're doing these fun science experiments. And, you know, just think of how cool this could be on the big scale whenever you get a little older and can do it with, you know, more, you know, um, Ex extensive type of uh, chemicals or things like that. So we really kind of focus on those things, really focusing on curiosity, encouraging curiosity, encouraging that confidence piece and showing you kind of what could be if you were to go into this field and then really just getting their mind wrapped around the idea. If I'm doing this now, just imagine what I could be doing in five years, in 10 years in this space. Yeah. And now there are levels of education and, and, and they all have their merit, but 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 you decided to go get a, a PhD. Why why what inspired you to go achieve that high level of of education to to support the and uh, to support the understanding that you wanted to have? So you know that's I, I reflect on that often. Um, why did I get a PhD? And really, one of the main reasons I ended up going to get a PhD versus like an MD or PharmD is really tied to the internship program that I was in when I was in undergrad. Um, I participated at, uh, in a program called the Minority Access to Research Careers at Tennessee State University, the best HBCU out there. And you said, while you said, I was- You said Tennessee State? It, yeah. you, you, oh, Oprah Winfrey and, and uh, you know, aristocratic bands? You know, a little something, a little yeah, something. Yeah, okay. I know, you know I'm, I'm familiar uh, with your school. You know, Oprah, my home girl, you know. Um, <laughs> In my mind, at least. Um, but yes, I was in this program called the MARC program. And um, part of that program was to really focus on um, giving people the internship experience while they're in undergrad with the goal of getting you into a research-based um, uh, post-secondary degree program. And so while a lot of my colleagues that were in the program did ultimately go get their MDs or PharmD, I, I, you know, I wanted to honor the program because I recognized that in order for them to maintain the funding, they had to have alumni of the program going into the research-based disciplines. Um, mm -hmm. And then ultimately at that, at that point in my life, I was really interested in doing forensic science. And so I saw, you know, if I could really establish myself as an expert in this field and, and, you know, what better way than being a doctor in the field um, could help me establish that credibility. Um, I felt that that was just a great, uh, you know, would really help me land well once I finished school. And it helped that the school that I picked, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago for my PhD, they had forensic science programs that I could take um, as an ad hoc to or an elective to the program that I was doing in analytical chemistry. So my PhD is in analytical chemistry, but then I did a concentration in forensic science by picking and choosing the classes that are, were relevant to what I was interested in. All right. And because I know a bit about where you are professionally, I'm going to try to trace two or three different things back to your childhood. And if you could just search through your, your memory bank and see, see what you can net from your childhood. I, I know that you're now an entrepreneur. Yes, where, where, where did entrepreneurship show up in your childhood? So I know exactly where it showed up from my aunt. Uh, so I had an aunt, uh, my aunt, Deborah, Deborah Lanier. Um, 
she was the had the biggest hustler spirit I could ever imagine. She ran a, a beauty salon out of our her basement, um, you know, full fledged beauty salon, and just watching her connect with clients, you know, make them feel empowered and beautiful as she was servicing them. Um, I would say hands down, I got it from her. She would have us on adventures, you know, doing all types of things. <laughs> Um, to to um, really just get her business out there and then also finding unique ways to showcase talents that we had. So, you know, um, you know, I have a, a number of different talents and I think the multitude of different things that I can do really re resonates from the things I saw her doing. You know, she was doing hair, she was um, helping, uh, you know, doing daycare services. So yeah. just watching her and what she, you know, the grind she did for her family really um, trickled down to myself for sure. Yeah, I, I, I doubt there's a family that doesn't have a great example of that either we, we doing some hair, we doing some nails, or mm -hmm. a daycare uh, for, for the guy, car, car detailing. We, yep. we, there's, there's a little bit of that in, uh, in most of our families. So it's great when we can hang on to that as an example and maybe do something else with it, but it gives us a starting plate. You're, you're, all, you're also an artist. So can you, can you source me back to where, how art became a part of your, your life and it developed into your adulthood? Yeah, so I mean, I think some of my earliest things when I think about artwork, I used to just love to doodle. Um, I think in fifth grade, me and one of my friends, we started a comic book series where we were just oh, like dude. drawing like uh, a series of, of characters of ourselves. Um, and then also in that same year, I had a, my science teacher was also our art teacher. And he had us do a project where we had to create like a, a book. Um, and we had to monitor plants around our neighborhood over like the entire, you know, six week semester or something like that. And to this day, I still have the book and where I've drawn out like photosynthesis, I've drawn out all these different processes. And so even at such a young age, how, I was, how I was, old were you able to draw photosynthesis? I was 10 years old, fifth grade. Awesome. Yep. All right. 10 years old. And so then when I look, you know, go forward, you know, high school, I was still taking a few art classes. And then in college, it really became kind of an outlet for me where I was able to just start um, experimenting with different things. I was doing like drip art painting, which is like very abstract type of painting. Um, then I started making um, like a baby mm -hmm. signs, gifts for people. And I realized like, oh, this is just like a great way for me to express myself and give something to someone else. And so I, I, I really am just like a self-taught artist and have, um, it's been crazy to see, you know, going from painting things on my living room floor to then having artwork featured on the cover of magazines is just like mind blown. Never would have seen that happening. Yeah. And the, la the last thing I want to try to track all the way back to your childhood, what you, what you studied for your PhD research. Now it, it was very technical, so I'm going to need you to explain it to me again. Uh, and, I, and this time I promise I'm going to get it. Uh, but but then, then also point me back to where that, where that interest came from for you to be so passionate about it that, you know, it, it earned, earned a hundred plus a page paper uh, from you. Like, where, where, where did that specific topic come from? So that specific topic, I mean, great question. I am always been a fan of doing research on things that are relevant to myself or my community, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you look at diseases like glaucoma, diabetes, who are the biggest communities that are impacted by them? Ooh, they are us, us. our community, right? Uh -huh. um, specifically speaking, my mom was diagnosed with diabetes um, around this time that I started my PhD. And so recognizing that diabetes could lead to diabetic retinopathy, which basically ends up being a, a, a breakdown of your optic nerve and your, your vision eventually fails. My thought was, if my mama has just been diagnosed with diabetes, I want to figure out something that can ultimately help her in the long run, you know, make sure that I'm getting something out there that can help her or our community. And so my research was looking at animal models simulating uh, these different diseases, glaucoma, which is basically a buildup of pressure in your eye, um, diabetic retinopathy, which is the result of an imbalance in your insulin levels and your glucose levels go up. Um, and then looking at what neurotransmitters, the little signals that go off from your brain to your eyes, what neurotransmitters are being impacted as the disease progressed. So we had a controlled um, model where we knew where you, where you were at before we um, were able to simulate glaucoma or diabetes. And then we were able to monitor um, the changes in the fluids in your eye or in the animal eyes over time. So these were considered to be in vivo processes. So we weren't um, putting down the animals. They were, you know, alive. They were sedated. Um, they were, of course, um, not subject to, you know, 
extensive amount of pain or anything like that for us to collect the, the samples. A similar process to um, a procedure that happens in humans. Um, but with that, we were able to identify key um, neurotransmitters, um, specifically uh, nitrate and nitrite. Um, these are two uh, neurotransmitters that are uh, play a big role in like vasodilation, so the ability for your blood vessels to uh, get bigger or contract. And we found that in both of the diseases that, that neuro, those two neurotransmitters increased. So if we could figure out a way to block that increase, we could hopefully prevent the destruction of the optic nerve, which ultimately would prevent the vision loss. And so that was um, the, the focus of my research. And for me, like I said, it tied into, hey, this is something that impacts my community. And so I wanna be able to lend my voice or lend my research to helping improve this, this place. Wow, it's so so my so the insight that I have from making slime does not quite match uh, where you where you at, uh, but I was able to follow. Uh, it, it, and because I wear contact lenses, a lot of the, the terminology used uh, related to eyes, I've been lectured by um, mm -hmm. my eye doctor several times about you know in, in times where you might sleep with your contacts and, and blood vessel uh, contraction. Yep. So so yes, uh, awesome. And, and when you're able to do something that helps elevate your community, that 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 probably attaches the passion that you'll need to get through um, through that PhD process. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, was, there was plenty of passion because getting a PhD <laughs> is not for the, uh, the faint of heart <laughs> by any means. Tell me this, because I'm, I'm a big fan of HBCUs. What, what were some of your favorite, your best experiences or more, most memorable experiences at Tennessee State? Oh, so many, so many. I mean, one, if you know, if you've ever been to TSU, wonderful Wednesdays is a whole thing. So Wednesday, Wednesday at noon, you don't schedule a class for Wednesday at noon. <laughs> Basically noon to 2 p.m., we're kicking it on the courtyard. So literally, you know, it's music playing. It's getting to see the Greek um, Greeks strolling. It's getting to see friends that you haven't seen, you know, in some time. So it was just that sense of community was amazing. Of course, our football games, homecoming. I still go back to homecoming when my, my schedule permits now. Always a great time. But I think also probably the thing that I appreciated the most um, at HBCU, I grew up in an area where I was one of the only Black families. Um, my graduating class had a very small number of Black people in it, so I was not in a majority situation by any means. So then to go to an HBCU where I am surrounded by beautiful Black and Brown people that want to do well, that are, you know, striving to get a degree, that was just so much inspiration, something I didn't even realize I was seeking or needed as I was growing up, because I, again, I just wasn't raised in that, that area. And so seeing that, I mean, just you know, the, the connection to your HBCU family is like none other. Um, and it, it goes beyond just, you know, the connection you have to your specific HBCU. I think it's like almost an unspoken family bond that you have with other people that went to HBCUs just because, you know, it's a, a unique experience that can't be created elsewhere. You know, unless you went to HBCU, it's just very hard to put into words the power that that experience can have on your life. Yeah, I've been there. And what's it's the, the name of the football field is Haley Field or Hale Field? Yep, yep, Hale. Yeah, I've been I've been down there for you guys this homecoming. It, it's a good time. I I, yeah. I agree with you. They're, they're, yeah. they're, you guys don't lose too many parties. It, you you, you <laughs> win. Uh, so also, I'm sure that I'm sure that continues to to provide some support and uplift for you, um, both academically, professionally, and then also personally and, and emotionally. Of course. Now, I want to jump forward just a little bit because now you you have your. Can you describe to me your your STEM academy, and then then I'm going to have some questions about it once you kind of set the foundation for what it is. Absolutely. So Steam Ford Academy, we actually started back in 2017 as an in-person um, experience, just happening throughout the summer as a extracurricular thing to keep students engaged, excited about science, technology, engineering, art, and math. So we've added the A into STEM to make STEAM. Um, and so in person, we bring in you know, special speakers and things like that. Great time, you know, once, once throughout the year. Then fast forward when the pandemic hit, um, of course, the idea was like, okay, well, I don't know how we're going to do this in the summer. You know, we can't even see people. Um, so I was in the mindset that it was going to be on pause. Well, I had a friend reach out to me like, hey, can you do a birthday party for me, a science-based birthday party? I was like, sure, I can take the activities from Steam Forward, make it virtual. Cool. No worries. It was wildly successful. And then it was like, okay, well, we're going to be in, in this, this uh, you know, 
lockdown situation for some time, schools going back and teachers were reaching out like, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to teach this to students. I had parents reaching out to me. And so we decided to uh, launch it as a completely virtual program um, where we bring together cohorts of students to do hands-on experiments using low-cost resources. And so our, our mission with STEAM Ford Academy is to encourage youth to pursue science, technology, engineering, art, and math with confidence, curiosity, enthusiasm, and a genuine sense of belonging. Um, I have instructors. Um, right now, there are five other instructors besides myself, mm -hmm. all Black women, all PhD scientists that bring oh, yeah. over 40 awesome. years of experience to the classroom. So, you know, when they come into the classroom, you know, we first do our introduction, like, hi, I'm Dr. Janita, or I'm Dr. Candice, I'm Dr. Christina. Um, we talk about what the cool things we do in, in, in our day, day jobs, but then we work with them hands-on. So it's not just us showing them experiments, we're working through maybe a slime experiment, but then breaking down the science behind it. Like, why are we doing this? How did adding the baking soda help to thicken this up? Um, where have you seen this before? So not only just showing them the experiment, not just showing them the connecting points, but helping them to see how those things connect to their real life so they can see that this, these concepts are everywhere around them. You know, we've now, we're going into, we're in our summer cohort right now, getting ready for fall, but we have now alumni of our academy who have gone on, I'm talking about kids, gone on and have taught science demos at their school based on what wow. they learned in our classroom. Um, we have parents that have reached out to us saying, you know, hey, you know, my daughter, I've watched her in our class, like in her virtual school class, she never participates, she never talks. In our program, she's the first person raising her hand, the first person that wants to share and show and tell. And so it's something to be said about having this cohort where, again, you're seeing like-minded people with you. Um, you're you know, getting to be excited about this and not be intimidated because somebody, you know, external to you is saying that this isn't cool. Um, and yeah, we've it's just really been a, like, a, I mean, an amazing experience. I'm so grateful for the instructors that I have on the team um, and we're looking to expand um, in the future. So we're kicking up our academic school year. We partner with organizations to actually bring our program to classrooms. Um, and then we also run our independent academy that runs on Saturday mornings. You know, before I get fully enrolled in my analytical chemistry PhD program, I probably need to start with your class because it, it, it sounds like it might be uh, more uh, more fitting for where I'm at in terms of uh, my, my insight. Out of, gotcha. all, out of all the activities you do, and I'm sure you have a grab bag of like uh, a, a dozen, a couple, maybe several dozen activities. What, what things are like the big hits that are just like, you know, this is going to be, this is the home run session. This is the one that really gets all the kids going. So I, I would say I probably have three that I would, I, would, I would highlight. Some that are simpler, some that are a little bit more advanced. So the first one is just, we do this paper airplane and paper helicopter demo. Now, again, well, I'm people interested made, already. I'm hooked. Yeah. <laughs> people, people have made paper airplanes before, probably in class you've thrown them, but then understanding the science behind how to make a good paper airplane or why is it going further or not. That, and it's something that literally it just takes a piece of paper and scissors to, to run. So parents love it because it's low cost. Students love it because now I can figure out how to make the best airplane and then learn how to make a paper helicopter. That's one that a lot of people maybe have not seen before. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is the science of ice cream, because again, who doesn't love ice cream, but who also doesn't love to learn how, how and why are we making this, right? We can teach so many concepts from understanding how we make ice cream, like freezing point depression, um, phase matter changes, things like that. Um, but then my third one, because that one, oh, sorry, my second one, that was my, my favorite because I love ice cream. I got a sweet tooth. <laughs> and my third one, though, is uh, 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 an experiment called foam gnomes. So foam gnomes is one, that one requires external kits, right? You have to buy the supplies. But essentially, you're mixing these two really, really small liquids together. And the chemical reaction that takes place is called a polymerization reaction, where you're connecting these two to make these long series of, of polymers. And Oh my goodness, it goes from these two little bitty liquids to a huge pile of foam. You get to see like heat coming off of the, the, the experiment as it's, as it's generating, gas is being um, let go, the texture changes, the color changes. Um, but the foam that we're making is literally, I bet you the chair that you're sitting on right now got the foam in it, right? If you're sitting on a chair that's what? cushiony, that foam is called polyurethane foam or the foam that's in your Nerf ball, if you have a Nerf ball or the insulation in your house. So okay. this foam is literally everywhere around us. But by doing this quick little experiment, you can see 
pretty much all the indicators of a chemical change happening. You get to get this like big thing. Like, so it starts as two little liquids, a big pile of foam that's solid at the end that you can decorate and things like that. But you get to literally see, you know, the bubbling, the fizzing, the uh, odor being produced, the heat being generated. So it's an exothermic reaction. And kids, just, I mean, kids, adult, I've literally done this experiment with my niece when she was like three or four at the time. And my mom, who was not three or four at the time, at the same time. And they both were like, whoa, like this is so cool. So it's like um, such a fun experiment that you can teach so many concepts off of. So those would be probably my top three um, from you know low cost, low resource up to, you would have to spend a little bit of money, but it's still decent cost to get. You know, after 20 minutes in a conversation with you, I see exactly why your friend called you to host that birthday party. And I, Cause after this experience with you, I know you're gonna go off when it comes to science, she about to go off. Let's just get oh, yeah. her. <laughs> oh yeah, this is my jam. <laughs> and these kids are going to learn some science that day. Like it's, nobody's walking away without learning something. Uh, so that's all. What, when you have a PhD, it, it creates an interesting, unique uh, it, dynamic in friendship circles and family circles. What uh, what other things do your friends and family call you for because they know you have a PhD and you're smart and you're a scientist? Like, what does that make you? You're the family hotline for for what? Well, of course, you know, they hear doctor. So when COVID hit, they wanted, hey, is this safe to take? Hey, is this, you know, so I'm like, well, I'm not that type of doctor. I will give you my opinion. I'm not that type of doctor. Um, but, you know, outside of what I do as a, as a, as a scientist, I'm also a coach. Um, so I'm a leadership coach and a mm -hmm. career coach. And so a lot of times my friends Come call on, can, me. Can multiple streams of income. Hold oh, yeah. On. No, oh, listen, yeah. listen, yeah, listen yeah. I learned early. You got to, you know, got to get the coin a lot of different ways. Um, so I went to um, actually Georgetown University to get uh, an executive certificate in leadership coaching. And I did that because I realized like so many people were just coming to me organically. And I loved being able to help others figure out the next step, um, you know, strategize, plan, um, come up with, you know, you know, what I want to get here, what are the things I need to do? And so I was like already doing it unofficially, but I figured, you know, let me add some credentials behind my back, get, you know, my toolkit in order to be able to be, be of service to others. Um, so that's probably the big one, you know, when people have, um, career angst or they're kind of toggling between negotiating an, a new offer or they're thinking about launching a business. Um, they often will come to me for that. Um, finances, I mean, again, I love a good coin and I love to make sure that we are financially free. Um, so I love to talk to my friends about investments, um, different strategies for being able to become financially free. Um, and then also probably just like workout advice. Um, I am a huge um, wellness person. I've had a lot of surgeries throughout my life um, that have put me down for various time points. Um, and so I really try to, you know, live a healthy lifestyle. So working out, um, figuring out ways to just keep my, my mind, my body, my soul in the best place. And so a lot of times people would just look to me for motivation when it comes to just their working out. I used to put videos up all the time, but I've, I've since stopped doing that as much, but I put them in my stories now just for <laughs> when I'm working out. Um, but yeah, so probably those are probably the big ones that people come to me for. Yeah, there's one more thing I want to get from your childhood. You mentioned cabbage patch dolls is uh, likely a, a, a favorite among your toys, uh, but there there was also a lot lots of there were lots of shows and cartoons and things. Do you remember anything that might have might have been a consistent part of your 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 just your childhood is in terms and, and, and if pointed towards them, great. Even, and if not, that's just as good too. What were some of your like favorite cartoon shows? Things that you know that you were into when you were consu consuming consuming media as a child. Yeah, so I loved Alvin and the Chipmunks. Um, <laughs> I love them because they sing. So I can't sing, but we, well, others say I can't sing. In my mind, I can sing. But uh, Alvin and the Chipmunks, you know, they used to do all the like kind of like um, remakes of songs. So I loved them. I loved um, uh, with Snoopy, uh, Snoopy and Char Charlie Brown. I love mm -hmm. them. Rainbow Bright. Um, yeah. The, uh, the Muppet Babies. Oh, I love the Muppet Babies. And there used to be the show about koalas. I don't remember what the title of it was, but it came on like Nick Jr. And it was about like mm -hmm. koalas and they would be eating eucalyptus leaves. I don't know. Um, I remember that show. Um, yeah, I think a lot of my shows, there was some like animal character often somewhere integrated in there. Um, so I'm not sure if that kind of pushed me into science or if it was more of just, like I said, tapping into the little, the creativity side of the house. Um, I think I liked the Muppet Babies a lot because they used to like, envision themselves doing different careers and living out different fantasies. And so um, they were probably one of my fan favorites for sure. 
All right. And then just jumping back into where, where you're closer to where you're at professionally now, your, your time in South Africa, you were invited to South Africa or you did something virtual for them in terms of building STEM curriculum for kids? Which, which version of engagement was it? A little of both. And so I actually initially applied to go to South Africa. So there was a program through the State Department um, called the Embassy Science Fellowship, where they would place uh, government employees at different locations around the world that needed their expertise um, to assist with a particular project. So the project that I applied to work for was with an organization called SciFest Africa. So you're in DC, you know about the USA Science and Engineering Festival, which is a huge uh, science fest here. In South Africa, their, their sister organization, SciFest, is their large science festival. So it's a week-long program um, for a lot of people in the country that is their science for the year. So I'm gonna say that again. A week-long program is their science for the year, right? And so my role with that program was to actually develop interactive curriculum for the science festival um, and thinking of new ways to teach science. So not just like doing fun chemistry experiments, but like, okay, uh, let's do a murder mystery or like a, um, a play around science and get the audience involved in the science aspects of this play. Um, let's go to the park and figure out like different activities we can do in the, in the, the park that will get people excited about science. Um, but also along with that, I was leading an outreach team where we went to different uh, schools and organizations on the East and West Coast of South Africa and we would literally bring our lab supplies with us and run experiments and run demos with the students and the teachers. So we were tapping into the students, giving them um, some science curriculum, but also teaching the teachers how to be better teachers in this subject. Um, because much like here, a lot of the teachers there didn't necessarily have a background in science. They um, ended up pivoting into teaching science, but didn't really have the, um, the uh, curriculum knowledge that would really set them up for success. So we started um, a training series for the teachers around there. So my first time there was through me applying. I got accepted to the program and I spent three months there. Um, all the subsequent times have been invited back. So um, I've gone back at this point. Uh, two years, two different years after the first year that I was there. I was supposed to go back in 2020, but then the pandemic hit. Um, but then from there, I transitioned to working with them virtually. And so now I led um, like a six part series for them during the summer of 2020. Um, I also did, um, I've done like just ad hoc kind of pop up videos for them. Um, but they're, they are, they are strong community partners to me and um, have been supportive of myself, the Steam Forward Initiative, um, and really just, um, you know, getting more people excited about science. Yeah, the, the, all the examples that you're giving me are, I'm, what I'm trying to come up with is my, my favorite things to do that have been STEM related and activities that I probably got from Pinterest or something. So mo most parents that are coming up with activities for their kid, we're going to do static electricity, we're going to put a, you know, rubber balloon on our shirt, probably going to do some slime, we'll likely do a volcano. If you're fancy, you, you, you the Pepsi bottle with the, um, what are you sticking Mentos. there? Mentos. Mentos, we're going to do that. Well, may, may, maybe you're getting the baking soda balloon um, blow up. But what, mm -hmm. what, what, is, what else is like kind of a, a favorite amongst, you know, us, us that are very amateur, uh, just in terms of using things in the kitchen uh, to, to create a STEM activity for our kids? What, what else have you seen a lot of parents doing? So I've seen a lot of parents do like invisible ink. So that's one where you only need like lemon juice, Ooh. right? Oh. So take the lemon juice. Yeah, take lemon juice and a Q-tip and some paper and you dip your Q-tip in, in the lemon juice. You can write out a message and you can't see it. In order to reveal the message, you need a heat source to actually cause the um, the, the, the compound to break down. And so you, you uh, take a hair dryer and just kind of blow on it. And then it'll go from being invisible to now you see brown letters and you can reveal the message. So that's probably a really simple, easy one. Um, another one, not necessarily kitchen supply, but um, household supply is marble art. Um, so using shaving cream and food coloring. And you, because of the um, different properties of shaving cream and food coloring, they're not going to naturally mix. And so you can create um, using uh, like a popsicle stick, the, like marble art by like just swirling it around yeah. and then take a piece of paper, place it in, into it, pull it out. And then you have this transferred design on this. So you can make custom like, Father's Day cards or Mother's Day cards or placeholders. Um, let's see what other things. Um, we also love doing um, uh, a water wheel. So using paper cups and plates and a, a, a skewer and you, you know, affix the cups to the plates and then you can put it under water and it'll turn. So it talks about renewable energy and how you can use oh, this. Oh, gravity and the weight of the yep. water will turn it. Yep. 
Yep. Um, so those are probably some ones that I've seen parents love and enjoy. Um, catapult math. So learning how to make catapults out of either marshmallows and, and popsicle sticks or using popsicle sticks and just a, um, a binder clip and rubber bands. Um, but tying it into making a game out of it and, and you put like bowls out in front of you and try to get your target into there and count your score. And so they're having fun flinging it, but then there's the math component figuring out what your score is. And so those have been, I think the most recently in our academy last some, last year, uh, that was hands down, the kids like love that one, the math catapults. Um, so there's, I mean, there's a ton, ton of options out there. You're, you're full of these things. I don't see you reading from any notes. This, this, okay. these, <laughs> these things are all- I have, a, I have a notebook in front of me, but you'll see there's really nothing on here except for just uh, the couple tips you, you would ask me about earlier, but yeah, this is just straight off the dome. <laughs> where, where does this go? You, you, you'll carve your own path and you, you, you're you already very successful doing this um, and you'll, you'll, you'll continue to incrementally uh, do it on larger stages. But what, what's an example of somebody or uh, a company or uh, entity? Where, where, where does this go as you continue to grow? What, what's an example of someone or an organization that was doing it before you that may have had a bigger scale than what you're at right now? So, I mean, I think I said this before and I'll say it again. I want to be the next Bill Nye. You know, I want to be on TV talking to the masses, explaining what's happening and getting people excited. So I would love to be on a TV show um, or even just being comparable to like a science and engineering festival where we're putting on large scale activities, being, bringing people from around the country. Um, those are probably be kind of the two, you know, North stars to where we're working towards of really just taking this from these small, more localized activities to being more large scale and reaching just as many students as possible. This has been absolutely wonderful. I, I, I want to be respectful of your time, so I don't want to hold you forever, but I, I'm so glad I had a chance to have this um, active conversation with you uh, so, that, so that I'm more tuned into what you're doing. Uh, and then I re realized how easy and, or and organic it is for you. This is not you're not reading from a handbook. This is just uh, you walking in your own natural self. Uh, so kudos to you. And this this, Thank this, you. this rocket ship is just going to keep going further and further and further. So I can't wait to see uh, when the TV show happens and you're on all the, you know, you have your own, you, you have your own everything. You have your own platform streaming thing and show and, and all the things that are that you're able to achieve. Absolutely. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Pritchard. As, we, as this continues to develop and I'll get home and I remember all the things that I didn't ask that I should have, you, please, please let me do this again with you and, and maybe six months or so uh, so course. I can fill in more gaps and, uh, and offer additional insight to all the, the parents and the moms and the dads and the teachers and the administrators and the STEM professionals that all hopefully follow my account. Absolutely. I look forward to joining you again. Thank you so much for having me uh, share this space with you today. All right. Thanks, everybody. Please, if you if, if you if you love it, uh, please make sure you like the video and subscribe to the channel so you can see uh, our upcoming videos. Thank you so much for joining us today.